Uganda's pop star turned opposition MP Bobby Wine is facing a charge of treason. His supporters say he was beaten while in custody as the government faces protests and widespread condemnation. So what's behind the recent unrest? This is Inside Story. Welcome to this edition of Inside Story. I'm Sahil Rahman. Perhaps the best known face of the Ugandan opposition, Bobby Wine, is in custody once again, facing a charge of treason, which carries the death penalty. The singer, who became an MP last year, has been a strong critic of President Yari Museveni, who's been in power since 1986. His arrest last week led to widespread protests and a crackdown by state forces. And when he showed up in court on Thursday, Wine showed signs of injuries. His supporters say that he was beaten while in military custody. Well, we have a lot to discuss with our guests, but first, this report from Catherine Soy in the Ugandan capital, Kampala. This is the man many Ugandans had been wanting to see. Bobby Wine, a popular musician and member of parliament, appeared at a military court in the northern town of Gulu, looking weak yes. and in pain. He had been in military custody since last Wednesday. He was arrested following violence in local election campaigns in the north after President Yoweri Museveni's motorcade was attacked. The state withdrew the military-related charges of possession of firearms and ammunition. You are accordingly set free unless being held on other charges. It was an emotional moment for Wine, but he was not really free. Honorable Chagurani is wanted and they are arresting him now. He was immediately taken to a magistrate's court where he was charged with treason. With the intent to do harm to the person of the President of the Republic of Uganda, unlawfully aimed and threw stones, thereby heating and smashing the rear windscreen of the presidential car. In Kampala, the government deployed police and soldiers in some parts of the city that are seen as hotspots, including where we are right now. We are trying to prevent people from gathering or trying to get to the town centre. Security forces also blocked several opposition politicians from leaving their homes. Kiza Besija, an opposition leader who has been arrested and detained often over the years, was again taken by police. He had earlier talked to the media. Cutting off 10 people cannot be cutting off 40 million people. So people, wherever they are, they must be able to do what they can with what they have. The magistrate in Gulu ordered that Wine gets urgent medical care and that doctors be allowed unhindered access to him. He will remain in custody until the end of the month when he appears in court with 32 others also charged with treason. All the while, his supporters in Gulu cheered him on, saying they won't relent until he's free. Catherine Soy, Al Jazeera, Kampala. Before we bring in our guests, let's take a quick look at Uganda's political history. It gained independence from Britain in 1962 with Milton Obote as Prime Minister. In 1971, Obote was toppled in a military coup led by Army Chief Idi Amin. Amin's time in power included the expulsion of Asians and the deaths of hundreds of thousands of his own people. In 1979, Tanzania invaded Uganda, forcing Amin to flee the country. A year later, Milton Obote regained power after elections and became president. But five years later, he was deposed in another military coup. And in 1986, National Resistance Army rebels took Kampala and installed Yari Museveni as president. And he's been in power ever since. Well, we'll talk to our guests in a moment, but first let's go over to the Ugandan capital, Kampala, where we're joined on the telephone line by opposition MP Alan Seswanyama. Good to have you with us on Inside Story, sir. Can you tell us what the situation is like on the ground? It must be quite tense. Yeah, of course, the situation is not uh, OK. It is quite tense. Uh, since uh, the 13th of this month, where we had uh, an election campaign gone bad in Arua, and some of our members of the opposition who had gone to campaign for a fellow member 
uh, were arrested by police after killing one of the drivers who were driving uh, one of the members of parliament. Um, some of them were arrested from Gulu and others were arrested from a military barracks in Kampala over allegations of inciting violence and some of them treason. And another one, Honorable Chagulani, for having uh, weapons, which is against the laws of this country. Of course, we, uh, as the opposition, we have had such problems and uh, we know uh, what comes along with opposing a government Indeed. which doesn't allow freedom of movement, uh, freedom of speech, and uh, cannot give peace to the opposition. If this is the um, underbelly, if this, this is uh, if this is the underbelly of what you're experiencing right now as a member of the opposition, and from the phone calls you must have been having with many of your supporters across Uganda, how do you feel about your own safety, considering what's happened to Bobby Wine? Of course, I'm much concerned on, on my safety because we've been into this uh, together. We've been opposing the government together. We have the same age, and uh, uh, the main problem that we are causing to the government now, since we are youths, we call on the message to the youths, and they take it uh, too much. Um, I'm concerned. I'm not safe anymore uh, because I know that what I do is uh, watched by government, and that's why even to get me on the phone, it has been a problem to you. Um, we don't have any security. We don't have anything. Uh, we are or is being taken uh, to prisons and police. Uh, like yesterday when I tried to go and witness uh, mm -hmm. a court session of my friend Chagulani, I was arrested at home, which uh, clearly states that I'm not safe either. Uh, we are going to many problems. Our supporters are being beaten. Uh, you see they, are, they, they, they can pick them from their homes and being arrested. Some have been killed. So we have a tougher time in Uganda due to the politics which is not going on well. Indeed, I think you colour a very concerning picture for the global audience who are watching this edition of Inside Story. Alan Saswanyama, thanks very much for joining us from Kampala, sir. Well, let's bring in our guests now. From London, we have Joseph Oshina. He's a commentator on African affairs. In the Ugandan capital, Kampala, Rose Bell Kwagamere, a blogger and writer on African issues and affairs. And also in London, Alex Vines, who's the head of the Africa programme at Chatham House. Welcome to uh, all of my guests. Um, Roosevelt, I'll start with you because we heard what an opposition MP is thinking and saying and feeling in the capital that you uh, come from this evening. How much concern is there amongst the public and on social media about what's going on? Um, the, thank you for having me. The, really, the mood in Kampala, like the, the Honourable MP has said, it's really tense. Ugandans were shaken yesterday, seeing images of Bobby Wine, who could hardly walk by himself. He was on clutches. And for a whole week, we've been looking at images of a, another a, a MP who is on, on, in hospital and has been on life support. So the, the mood is really tense, and people are really afraid of what uh, future we'll, we'll have if elections are a do or die. Indeed, those elections 2021. Joseph Fashin, let me bring you in from London. I mean, how much of a threat can a songwriter, singer, ex-rapper really be? He's a shocker, isn't he, So Hill? Um, <laughs> yes. I, I think uh, in, in context, this is really not new. Um, Seven has been in power for 32 years. He came to power violently, but he also used violence for the first 10 years of his government to suppress the democratic opposition. Over a period of time coming to about 20 years, when the traditional recent opposition like Kiza Besige came in, um, he was one of their own. Besige got as much beating as many of these opposition leaders have had. What is new is that Bobby Wine is relatively young, as uh, your earlier guests seem to suggest, but also, too, because he came from a circle that was supposedly unknown. He was three years old when Museven came to power. So I think there is an element of impunity and complacency in government. But the fact that this guy came in, stood as an independent MP, went to parliament, he's now supported two independent candidates, and they've won, mm. and he's able to stand up. He's a singer, he's an artist, and by the way, he's also able to talk, to articulate without prejudice, where in politics we probably assume that artists are not necessarily guys who would actually play intellectual rigor when it comes to poly body politics. 
it is substantially new. Mm. What is it? It is the case that the international community is now joining all Ugandans and listening to the kind of messages that really has been across the country for the last nearly 32 years. And that is what's going on. It is new. It's being impacted thanks to social media. Indeed. And we'll talk about what the international community is saying hopefully later in the programme. Alex Vines, can I bring you in here from London as well? How much of a breath of fresh air is Bobby Wine? How much of a threat is he to Museveni in that lead up to presidential elections in 2021? Oh, look, Mr. Museveni is, is nervous. He's worried. Um, he has been, as uh, your, 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 the previous speaker said, been in power since 1986, so over 30, coming up to 30 years odd. Uh, that's a tremendously long period of time. And there's a desire for change. There's a desire for change uh, in Uganda, particularly because so many Ugandans, the majority of them, were born after Mr. Museveni became president. So. There's an, uh, there is a desire for a new narrative, new politics, uh, new ways of doing things. And uh, somebody that doesn't come from the stable of, of, of liberation, if it's the way we call it, for, from the National Resistance Army background, is something that's completely new. Mr. Museveni will be very concerned about his chances for a sixth term and in, Alex, in how important 2021 is... when the elections are next hold. Uh, Alex, how important is the youth vote? In recent elections in Pakistan, we saw how important social media and the youth vote were, a youth vote uh, where they weren't following the, the designated political parties. Here in, in, in Uganda, we're seeing the same sort of trend where we have a generation who won't remember, as you say, the liberation, uh, so to speak, of, of Uganda from various military coups and, uh, and democratically elected governments as, as and when they were. How influential are, is such a young population in Uganda at the moment when they have someone like Bobby Wine who speaks their language? Yeah, I mean, Bobby Wine is a charismatic uh, young politician. Uh, he speaks their language. He, he, he is the, uh, the, the standard bearer of change and representing new politics. Uh, and so plenty of Ugandans will, will be interested with him, in him. Uh, not only that, I think there's international interest because of this. Uh, and also, we have to look at the historical pattern that's developing, the pattern that we're seeing at the moment across Africa, is that long-standing leaders like Mr. Museveni are increasingly under pressure. A couple of long-standing leaders left office last year. This is a trend we're going to see continuing as these uh, leaders get older and older and more divorced from the politics of youth. Indeed. I mean, Roosevelt in Kampala, Bobby Wine seems to cross cultural barriers and doesn't really care about tribal affiliations or political divides, even if uh, somebody is fighting a member, a seat in Parliament and he's not from Bobby Wine's party, Bobby is still supporting him and that's very important. It's showing sort of a, a cross political support that wasn't in Ugandan politics before. Is that correct and how is that resonating amongst, again, the younger generation or even the older generation? How are they viewing this? I think you have to realize Uganda is the second youngest country in the world with an average age of 19. Bobby Wine came to the national scene around early 2000s through, through his music. So we grew pretty much myself, university days, grew up on Bobby Wine's music. And that's the experience, the first experience. And his music uh, slowly began to appeal to the political, uh, to carry political messages. And you have to see also his story. He grew up in an informal settlement in the suburbs of Kampala. In fact, he's locally known as the ghetto president. So he's adored and, uh, and people can see he can articulate their issues. He knows what it is to come from the trenches and be somebody and sit in a place where nobody expected you to be and bring your own table, bring your own seat to the table. He has done that to the, to the status quo. So that's the story young Ugandans relate to rather than somebody who was part and parcel of the military, of the current establishment. They are seeing a new face, somebody they can relate to finally. And he cuts a Across tribal lines, because we have an, a, a young generation that okay. pretty much can see beyond tribal lines. Uh, uh, Joseph, can I bring you in here? Because it's all we want to say he's a fresh young face on, on the political stream. But if you take away gun charges and then you charge him with treason, which is uh, potentially uh, a capital crime, but you put him behind bars, you take that face away from the potential electorate. How dangerous a game is the government playing right now with these charges? 
extremely dangerous. Of course, they've been to this before. And obviously, uh, as um, Rosemary, Rosemary would suggest, uh, and like I said much earlier, um, we've been at this game for the last 33 years. The only difference is that we're not covering them on Al Jazeera. You know, the truth is that Museveni charged people with treason from as early as 1986, from some of his many friends. So people who've been charged with treason, with treason in Uganda are in their hundreds, perhaps. Um, so Kiza Besige himself was charged with treason. Many of this would have been trumped up, trumped up charges. The more you charge people like Bobby Wine and the Zakes of this world and put them in prison, the more you make it much more difficult. The reality today is it's not even perhaps about even Bobby Wine per say. It is very much about where Uganda is at the moment. And in fact, we're talking about the questions of identities and even ideological divides. It's no longer about that. Ugandans are very much focused about basically wanting change, basically wanting anybody, anything they would latch onto to basically simply say no to Museveni. To the extent that actually people now came into the streets of London, across the world, um, in, in unprecedented numbers. They were really not caring about Bobby Wine per se, by and large, that was substantial. But most importantly, they simply just tired. So anything they were lying to at the moment is about Bobby Wine. If they go beyond where they did, and actually, as independently, they quite surprised me. I don't know who advises this government these days that they actually did what they did last week. If they did anything far worse, than what they've so far done today, they'll make the situation worse for themselves. Alex, I bring you in here because the international uh, reaction to this is pretty varied. We've seen demonstrations by MPs in neighbouring Kenya. Uh, we have question marks as to whether the Commonwealth uh, or even the African Union will uh, make any statements, but the US certainly has. Uh, and it says uh, in its um, text in its uh, social media message, it decried, the, it decried the brutal treatment of MPs, journalists and other security forces by the incumbent government. Uh, and when you have musicians such as Chris Martin, Chrissy Hine, Brian Eno uh, and the African great Femi Kuti also getting in, weighing in on this uh, arrest and the situation in Uganda, again, it, it, there is concern there, is there not, in the international realms? There, there, there is. Look, uh, Uganda is seen as an anchor state. It's a, a, a country that has seen a, a, a significant degree of stability uh, uh, since the, 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 the 80s, uh, and there's been significant investment. It is a rough neighborhood. It's got South Sudan next to it. It's got the Democratic Republic of the Congo as a neighbor. Uh, but there is increasing concern that uh, uh, Mr. Museveni, after so many terms in office, is increasingly becoming a source of instability. I think the reading is that his own ambition, Mr. Museveni's vision, is probably to remain in office for many more years and uh, maybe die of natural causes in office. Uh, that's not a sustainable proposition. So I can see increasing international signaling that, that uh, uh, things need to change in Uganda. The, the reality, though, is things will only change Ugandan, in Uganda if Ugandans themselves uh, grasp, that, grasp the opportunity. Uh, and I think clearly the new politics that's uh, happening, partly uh, vanguarded by uh, Bobby Wine, is it exactly what is occurring. Well, just take a slide. Um, Mr. Museveni really doesn't want to, 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 to countenance any, uh, you know, any exit uh, and uh, you know, is convinced he will be elected or re-elected, should I say. Uh, in 2021. Uh, certainly wasn't trying to interrupt you there, uh, Alex. Let's just uh, bring our up to speed um, with some more information for our viewers uh, back at home because uh, Uganda has a population of over 34 million people with more than three quarters of them under the age of 30, as has been mentioned earlier in this conversation. Agriculture is an important part of the economy, employing one third of Ugandans, but an estimated 14.2 million people, that's nearly half the population, are thought to be living in extreme Poverty. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, leading in from what Alex just said there about, you know, what the population must really need um, and what the international community are looking at. If we just look at, you know, in, in your neighbourhood of Zimbabwe, and we saw and we still see that over the, the Mugabe regime, there was still a great deal of poverty, a great deal of angst among the public because they wanted to see their lives better. I mean, the average wage for a household, according to the Ugandan National Household Survey of 2016, that's the most recent we have, is $45 a month. It's 1% GDP, and 85% um, of the population are in informal paid work. I mean, it, it, they're terrible statistics for a country that ha is rich in resources and potential. And, and a lot of the population where you are really just don't feel as if they're part of that growth. 
Um, I think you have to realize that uh, we have a very high youth unemployment in this country, and several reports from the World Bank, from other agencies, show that for every three Ugandans that have managed to go out of the poverty, to skip the poverty line, two of them fall back because there are no social security mechanisms. And so young people compose the majority of those people who fall back into poverty, and they're increasingly uh, un, uh, you know, agitated with that. Every day you have hundreds of Ugandans lining up at our airport, going to the Middle East to do educated Ugandans with graduate degrees, to do simple labor jobs, to be house helps, to do domestic work. And that really shows the dire need of any uh, economic reform that is necessary to turn things around. But unfortunately, the government of President Museveni is well known for its financial hemorrhage of this nation. He runs a very highly uh, political a political system that benefits him, where he has to reward his people, the people he chooses, with a lot of money. He just paid off a lot of uh, legislators for him to pass, to, to remove the age limit, which would have deterred him from running again. So he has a lot of ways, he finds ways to all these monies uh, that find the way to, to his supporters, but they don't find their way to the budget lines and to invest in the key areas which are supposed to spark the necessary development. We've seen a constitutional change, uh, Joseph, where the president's terms now will continue, um, though, and I'm quoting here from 2012 to a local television station where he said that he did not want to lead Uganda beyond the age of 75. We know that's not going to happen. One has to sort of work in the realms of hypotheticals well, now to a certain extent, and we've seen people and people in power in Africa deposed by the military. Uganda is no stranger to that. What is the role of the military at the moment? Are they in Museveni's pocket or are they an independent group that can think for themselves if the situation with the public gets worse? Uganda is perhaps the most unique, only followed by Rwanda. The army is basically Museveni's baby. Um, um, Bobby Wine, as you hear, they talk about the gun. Museveni immediately mentioned anything to do with, with guns. He gets scared. He's a former police chief who's himself a general. He's actually facing trial today, gun-related. Part of this is actually linked to the geopolitics of the region, where Museveni and Kagame are not particularly good friends within, with each other. And all, it, it, all of, both of them are actually accusing the other of wanting to, to ferment opposition to the other. You can't read into between that. But the point uh, Alex was making about the stability, that's part of the challenge for us in Africa. You know, Australia has had the, the fourth prime minister since 2010. Australia is not unstable. In Africa, and particularly in Uganda, we're graced with Museveni where the, 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 the narrative of stability was used to actually entrench one man in, 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 in power. And Museveni directly responsible really for most of the instability in the region. But stability in Africa, when in as long as it means one person who is able to hold state power, but using military might backed by and large by the West, it becomes rather unfortunate for us. Okay. Going forward, though, Museveni didn't, as I said, know that, know that he would be challenged in this way. The reality is that he fears that come the next elections, the, the threshold is such that perhaps it might even be harder for him to get 51% uh, of the votes and therefore be taken to second round. And Ugandans will rally around whoever is the alternative. And that alternative is likely going to be backed by the vast majority of young people. So it's a scare for him. OK, uh, Alex, I just want to come to you for the last question because we're at the end of the programme nearly. If we fast forward to the future and we don't know uh, what that will bring, if wine is incarcerated and sentenced to death for treason, how's, go how's that going to play out for Museveni's government? Uh, uh, and also within the domestic public, do you think, and the international community? I think it will be very difficult for Uganda. Uh, I think that you'll get uh, Western countries uh, don't regard Uganda as strategic. So there can be a, a moral element to their foreign policy. Uh, and the Ugandan economy is very vulnerable. It's not as a, a, a strong economy. It needs foreign direct investment. It is in a difficult neighborhood. So I, I hope that the Ugandan government will think very carefully uh, on how it progresses at the moment, because uh, it is a vulnerable economy, and if the economy deteriorates further, uh, that would in turn impact on the politics even more. It would uh, exacerbate things even further for Mr Museveni. So this is a really important watershed moment for the country, I think, and its future political trajectory. Well, I think uh, your other guests as well on the show, Aldo nodding in agreement, uh, and there, unfortunately, we have to leave it. I'd like to thank all of my guests, uh, Joseph Ashino. Rosabel Quagomare and Alex Vines for joining me on this edition of Inside Story.
And thank you for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash Al Jazeera Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the entire Inside Story team, thanks very much for your time and your company. Bye for now.